Hello, everybody. So, welcome to the final development studies seminar of 2018 2019. Um, thank you. Um, we're really delighted. Uh, to end this series on what I think will be a fantastic session. And we're delighted to have uh, Professor Mwagi Wagi Tichi, our esteemed speaker, joining us tonight, uh, who's an associate professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he's also graduate program director of economics and co-director of the World Studies Interdisciplinary Project. He did his PhD at the University of California, Riverdale, and was previously an Associate Professor of Economics and Chair of Africana Studies at Gettysburg College, Pennsylvania. His work has focused on issues of class, gender, and income distribution in relation to agrarian transition and nationhood in Africa, as well as the role of structural transformation and the global economy in the development process. He's the author of 10 Millionaires and 10 Million Beggars, published by Ashgate Press, which examines issues of income distribution, class and gender in Kenya, and co-author of an employment-targeted economic program for Kenya, published by Edward Elgar, as well as numerous articles and chapters. His most recent work on identity and economic outcomes in African countries explores the interaction between identity formation, the development of capitalism, inequality and nationhood. Professor Gideji has also undertaken an extensive development consultancy, including with UNDP and the Economic Commission for Africa. So we're extremely pleased to welcome him to SOAS tonight to talk to us about agrarian transition and development in an age of globalized inequality, some questions from Africa. We also have joining us this evening as the discussant uh, for the talk, Professor Alfredo Sardfilio, Professor of Political Economy in the SOAS Department of Development Studies, whose work is focused on the political economy of development, industrial policy, neoliberalism, alternative economic policies, and Latin American political and economic development. His most recent co-authored books include Brazil, Neoliberalism versus Democracy, and the sixth edition of Marx's Capital, both of which have been published by Pluto Press. Um, if you want to tweet during the event tonight, you can use the hashtag SOASDevStudies and ESRC. Uh, and thank you very much for your patience while we were slightly late getting started. But I'll uh, hand over to Professor Gideji now. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here at SOAS, which has long been associated with critical approaches to development, um, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, sometimes when you're working in a school that does have critical approaches, you don't appreciate um, what the rest of the world is like, and so it's nice to be in a friendly venue. Um, thanks in particular to Joanne Tompkinson for making all my arrangements, Faze smile for the invitation and patience with the topic and abstract, and Alfredo Sadfilo for suggesting I visit and facilitating the invitation. So the topic of, I picked for this, agrarian transition and development in an age of globalized inequality, some questions and now answers um, from Africa, is partially driven by kind of talking about what should I talk about. And you know, much of our own research tends to be very, very narrow, uh, very specific questions. But this gave me an opportunity to step back from a number of projects I'm working on and put them in the larger con context of kind of structural transformation and development more generally. So that's the way this, um, this talk is going to be framed. Um, a word of caution. <clears throat> I know all of you know Africa is not a country. So um, <laughs> when I say Africa, understand that I, I'm not thinking it's a country. Uh, there are lots of different countries um, with lots of different stories. I do think some, there are some general trends. And so I think the story I'll tell will fit to varying degrees in different countries. This, the story I tell, though, is, is, is very much informed by work mostly in Eastern Africa. Um, so 
Eastern Africa, the East African Highlands, when we think of the agricultural part. So that's, that's what really drives a lot of it. I'll organize um, the uh, story, the talk as follows. I have you know, five main parts. Putting in context the story of transition, discussing quite a bit what I'll call phases of African growth, because I think there's some collective um, forgetfulness that the world has about African economic history post-colonialism. And then thinking a little bit about what the transition is in a time of inequality and liberal rights. And then focusing on the rural transition and then coming back to a question of who does this. Um, so kind of who actively a more political economy uh, question. <clears throat> so the classic story we tell of structural transformation or structural transition is one which is exemplified by, by South Korea. And what I have up are uh, just a couple of graphs which highlights some main parts of this story. And the story is one of A, manufacturing and industrialization taking off. And as manufacturing and industrialization taking off, so that's our x-axis, right? Then they, ab they absorb labor. <clears throat> and that labor comes out of the rural sector. And as they absorb more people from the rural sector, then the rural sector is forced to pay higher incomes, right? Because there's now competition for that labor. And it's also forced to transform, adopt technologies etc. So that results in this kind of shape where you have incomes in the rural sector going up as the country moves from um, being a predominantly rural formation to a more manufacturing based uh, formation, right? Or a rural traditional formation to a more capitalist industrial formation, okay? Now, what else is interesting in the South Korea story is a story of inequality. Often economists will talk about this part of transition as one that occurs with increases in inequality. In the South Korea story, although there is some increase in inequality, these are measurements of genies over the period of rapid development for South Korea, there's some increase from maybe a roughly around 34 to maybe roughly around 36. It's not much. It's not that much of an increase. And so there are two aspects to this that I want to emphasize. One, the successful transition, and two, a transition that does not have large increases in equality. A similar story can be told of Finland, where Finland, in fact, if you go back to the 1920s, when it starts its transition, you have inequality actually going downwards. And we'll come back to this um, later on. It, it, it's something which I think is important. Now, while African economies, sorry, gone the wrong way. While African economies have had growth, um, they have not managed to go through the same amount of structural transformation. If you look at most African economies, they are still predominantly, or at least agriculture is still a very significant sector <clears throat> in production, whether it's by employment or output or sometimes um, both. Um, but they, did, they do, they have had some growth. So one, if we take post-independence Africa, so these are growth rates of per capita income post-independence Africa, three-year averages. Um, that's why it doesn't quite start it. It starts around 69. The data itself starts from 66. And what we compare here is the world and Africa. And part of my reason for putting this up is because Africa, in much of literature, has often been discussed as a place that has not grown till recently. 
And so for me, it's important, and we'll come back to this, to point out that there is this earlier phase immediately after independence where growth, particularly here just before 74, was as high as it's ever been in this more recent phase of growth. Okay? And so there's an early phase of growth for, for African countries that is pretty high. Um, so for that phase, you notice that Africa and the world go pretty much together. But during this point of crisis, they diverge. So this, this the beginning of neoliberalism, the first structural adjustment programs in Africa about 1982, Zambia and uh, Morocco, uh, sorry, and Algeria, both accompanied by bread riots. Um, and so through this period of what we might call structural adjustment and the movement into neoliberalism, you have mostly negative growth rate and a difference in the growth rates between the world and Africa. And then they kind of come back together till this later post-2008 period where actually Africa grows much faster than the rest of the world. So I, f I think of African growth as having three distinct uh, periods. And um, let me talk a little bit about them. Um, so I see them as three distinct periods. The first one is about 1966 by on the data, but you know, post <coughs> post independence um, up to about 82 to the beginning of structural adjustment. And then 83 to 96, which is a period of most intense structural adjustment. So that's a period when all the structural adjustment programs are in place, et cetera, and it's a period of negative or no growth. And then by 96, there is some change in, in policy, um, but not as much, and the structural adjustment has, for the most part, taken part. And then you have the post-97 to um, the present period, 2016 here, because that's where we have data till for the countries. These are marked by three different ideological and policy, um, I would say, policy regimes. Um, the first regime in the 60s up to the 80s, or up to, depending on where you're looking at, um, but I would say up to the 80s, is one in which the state played an important part in, in development policy often seen as either African socialism or some kind of nationalism. And it's important to, to because sometimes I'll joke, and, and you've probably heard this joke from other people, people will say that African socialism was signaling left but turning right, right? So, um, but they, why was there this African um, socialism? A lot of it was a response to colonialism. Colonialism equaled capitalism for Africans. Right? Post-independence, in practically all, all countries, independence came with democratization and multi-party elections. Okay? Again, you know, the 80s and the 90s are a return to multi-party elections, not an introduction of multi-party elections in Africa, a story that's forgotten. So, and you can't turn to people and say, look, we are taking over from the colonialists, and what we want to give you is the same thing they gave you. Right? That doesn't make any sense. So everybody, whether you, you know, Hufe Bonnie, who was going to implement a capitalism, still talked of a socialism of a kind. Right? He, he, he differentiated himself from the colonialism. Right? So, and, and you know, it carried various names, African socialism um, in some countries, African humanism in others, um, Jamhiria in, in Libya. So there were various names to to this kind of ideology and thinking. But the important part of this was to see the state as central in economic activity, so to the level of actually owning production um, uh, or productive resources. Then we moved to the period 83 to 96, where there was a break and the, the forceful opening up of African markets, the removal of the state, both from active policy making as it started in 
taking really policy directives from um, the IMF and the World Bank and its retreat from active production, active economic institutions. And then the present period where we do, the state has come back and it's, it's more accepted that the state should play a role, um, particularly in public investment, right? So the difference between these two periods is that in the 1980s, we were starting to talk about the private sector providing public infrastructure, right? If you wanted to build roads, you wanted to build toll roads, right? Now there's a little more acceptance that, okay, there's, there is a section of the society of the economy, the public sector, which needs to be constructed by the state, although all production should now be left to the, um, to the private sector. During these periods, there were different drivers of growth and different outcomes. Um, and let me just go through the first period, the, each period completely uh, alone. In the first period, growth was driven a lot by commodity prices, you know, we were coming off the post-war boom um, that, you know, and Africa got the tail end of that boom that goes from the 50s through to the 70s. Uh, so, as you can see, it's, it's kind of rising. So, we get the tail end of that boom. So, commodity prices were going up and Africa was able uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, development aid was also uh, significant. The main export partner was Europe. The former colonial powers were where most African exports went to, right? And often people have asked, well, why did Africa keep this kind of structure? Why did it keep a structure in which, you know, they argued that there was exploitation, yet when it was independent, it did not break away from that structure of being a primary exporter of goods? My argument is that it's... And again, this is where politics and economics come together. My argument is that it's, it, it's fairly simple. African parties, African political groups come into power post-colonialism. Pretty much across the board, they understand that this structure is not to their advantage in the long run. But in the short term, they've also made promises. They've made promises that they're going to improve schools, they're going to build roads. They're going to build more hospitals, right? And, and they do a lot of this, right? In the 1960s, before Kenyan independence, there were 90 schools, 90 high schools in Kenya. Four years later, there were 700 high schools. The main road from Nairobi to Mombasa uh, did not exist. Right? It got built in 72. I am not a fan of the first president of Kenya. I think he's a cause of many of the problems. But he, there's one thing he said. He said, at the 10th anniversary, he said, we have done more in 10 years than the colonialists did in 70 years. Okay? And in terms of that kind of physical infrastructure, there is some truth to it. But now, think about this. You come to independence, and you've promised these things, and you have to think about where you're going to fund them. Well, if you immediately stop exporting what you exported before, you don't have a means of funding these things. So for many of these countries, the idea was, we've got to keep doing this, but then we'll transition out of it. OK? And therein lies a rub, because it is actually very difficult to emphasize these exports and at the same time get out of them. Okay? And then when they get hit by the crisis in the 70s, you're stuck in primary production. So it wasn't a lack of understanding, I would say, but um, you know, a real political economy of, of things both in the country and in the world. The lead, invests, the lead sector in investment at that time uh, was the public sector. The public sector was extremely important. And the sectors themselves were agriculture, minerals, and manufacturing were the most important. And I'll come back to this. Um, 
<laughs> Manufacturing grew from practically nothing to nearly 11, 12% on average across, uh, across the continent. It has since fallen. Inequality for many of the countries that grew, it's not for all the countries. I've done an exercise elsewhere. Um, we don't have figures on inequality per se, but we have figures on life expectancy and health, which are often highly correlated with um, equalizing growth. It fell. So inequality fell for most uh, countries. Um, and at the level of integration across African countries, despite their rhetoric, integration was low. Okay, we were still in the colonial era where, you know, structurally, where if you were in Ghana and you wanted to talk to your cousin across the border in Cote d'Ivoire, then, you know, you could either shout across the border or you could pick up your phone if you had one, call Paris, which then called London, which then called your cousin who was 400 yards away, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the nature, there was you know, the turn to Europe eh, uh, in many things. So in the next phase, we had a number of changes. As the world went through the crisis of the 70s, one there were ideological changes. Africa, however, still depended on commodity prices and, and significantly aid to support its growth or lack of growth thereof. Europe was still the most important partner but now there's a turn to the private sector becoming the most important um, sector in investment. Agriculture in this period, and we'll show some other, uh, I'll show you in some other places, remained or even became a more important sector, and I'll explain why later. And inequality started increasing. So from this period on, inequality started increasing, and integration between African countries remain low. Now, let me just say quickly, before I get to the last one, a little bit on inequality, because I think there is, there used to be some perception before, well, it's interesting because we had some measurements, but we didn't seem to take them seriously. But there was kind of the assumption, particularly through the 60s to the 90s, that Africa was poor but equal, right? That there were relatively low levels of inequality, you know, people talked of Brazil as a place of inequality in Latin America. But the truth is, Africa has been highly unequal for a long time. So these are relative movements. Um, in fact, if you take historical data, um, looking at historical data from about 1895 to 1996, of the 11 highest measures of inequality, nine are African, dominated by Kenya and Zambia, right? So, you know, there's a history of inequality in this place that often is not recognized. By the third phase, growth is now positive and we've been celebrating, or at least we were celebrating this growth. Everybody talking about Africa being the next place, you know, the new African middle class, African Renaissance, all this stuff. And they, there was some perception that it was really different, but I, I think a lot of the growth has depended on commodity prices, both mineral and, um, both minerals and, uh, agricultural goods, the slight difference has been who has been buying them. So the rise of China and India ha have sh has shifted some of Africa's exports. That also along with remittances, remittances are underplayed but have been large. There are a significant number of African countries where between from 1990 to around the present, if you take the average of remittances, um, foreign direct investment and ODA, you'll find that in some cases, in countries as important or as large as uh, Nigeria, Kenya, 
Um, so both mineral exporters, agriculture, remittances can be as large as foreign direct investment and ODA combined. Right? So it's not, it's not something small. So the African diaspora has, has become an important contributor uh, to African growth. Then the, the investment is mixed public and private now. And minerals and services, services have become extremely important. The service sector has now become a leading sector for many African countries. And, you know, telephony, for example. Um, in many countries, the telephone, the mobile telephone company is one of the largest, if not uh, the largest uh, company. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that later as well. Inequality has been increasing, and now it's been recognized that it's increasing. And integration has also increased. There's been more conscious action for uh, regional integration. It's actually very strange because part of the regional integration is coming at a time when many of the leaders are not as outwardly Pan-Africanist as the leaders in the 1960s who are outwardly Pan-Africanist but had a lot of tension between them which got in the way of actual integration. You know, there were two views of Pan-Africanism. Um, you know, the so-called Monrovia group and the Casablanca group, where one view that led by Nyerere and for the Monrovia group viewed integration as something that would occur regionally and then built up, whereas the other group led by Nkrumah wanted, you know, the Big Bang kind of integration, the United States of Africa first, so the political in integration. Seek ye first the political kingdom and all things shall be added to it um, kind of approach. Just quickly, um, I won't mention, spend much time here. Here I just want you to notice a couple of things, the differences in period. One, you know, this doesn't tell you the full impact of the sector because we don't have the size of the sector, just how fast the value added is growing. But notice from 60, 1966 to 82, look how large, how fast manufacturing grew. Okay, so that's part of the story that's often forgotten. That's an important part of the story. The other part is how ser the service sector in this most recent period is the most important. The third part is, the third bit of the story that I want you to think about is how agriculture, although the laggard in overall, was the most important during the crisis period. And it's kind of a reserve sector. So as the economy slowed down, people went back to agriculture or became more dependent on agriculture for survival. And so during the worst of times, it was a sector that had the biggest growth in, in, in value added, despite getting less support. So we come back to this question of, we've had this growth, but this growth has not been transformative in the classical sense. And added to it is, we now want to think about growth, but we also want to think about it in the context of liberal rights, right? What do I mean by that? Most growth or most transformation into capitalism, into fully fledged capitalist countries, for many countries has not occurred under bourgeois liberal rights, okay? Or bourgeois liberal rights have not been fully established. So in fact, the states and the elites have had lots of leeway in appropriated land, engaging in the acts of primitive accumulation that allow for capitalism to develop, okay? Now, in the context of African countries today, this kind of freedom has shrunk, right? It's shrunk internally as people have en internalized more, um, liberal rights, and it's also shrunk externally as internationally people are more critical of um, authoritarian government. So we have to think of it in that challenge. So now, how do you do these things which can be ugly? How do you break the eggs without people screaming at you and refusing to cooperate? Okay? Um, <clears throat> 
And then we've got to think also of the internal structures of African economies that they have inherited. Okay. So there is the question of politics and rights, the question of internal structure, and then lastly the question of kind of a neoliberal global regime in which markets, sorry, markets are still very central and it's hard to have policy against markets. If you think generally of the structure of African economies, um, you, this is the way I like to think of them. I, I like to think of them as a kind of two-sector model with kind of a formal sector and a sector of reserve labor. The, the formal sector is a small sector, which is the capitalist sector, you know, large farms or large-scale mining, depending on the country, government and services, and a relatively small manufacturing sector, which has decreased in time. So I talked about it in the 70s, reaching about 13%. It's now dropped on average to about 8%. So it's actually gotten smaller. The reserve labor sector has been pretty much the same. Large smallholder sector, artisanal miners, and small scale artisanal producers, traders, and retailers. You know, in the urban areas, what has often been called the Juakali um, or the informal sector. As I've noted before, these economies are also characterized by high inequality, and there are different kinds of inequality. There's individual what we call vertical inequality differences between every individual, which are high, but they're also complicating this are horizontal or across groups or across region inequality that makes this story more complicated. What's the impact of this? The impact of this is that in fact, growth, given this structure, has not led to large increases, particularly in formal employment. So if you look at every percentage, 1% of growth, right, the amount of employment, the increase in employment in South Africa, for example, is just 0.5. In Kenya, it's 0.67, which means that you're getting very little increase in employment. And so if you have a growing population, in fact, you end up with kind of this story of the Kenya where... In the 70s, 4% of the jobs in the rural area were formal. But by the 2000s, that had dropped to 2.9. So it's like you're going backwards. In the urban areas, 25% of the jobs were formal in, in the 70s. By now, it's less than 12.5%. So you're going backwards. Now, what does this mean? What this means is that you have, in a sense, an increase in reserve army of labor. You know, an increase in number of people who are looking for jobs, which means that labor incomes are going to be depressed because all employers can offer less, right? So it holds down formal jobs and translates into higher profits, right? So it's also increasing inequality. At the same time as this has happened, because of the change externally, the impact of exports on growth has also changed. So in the first period, and I, I didn't put up the calculation, but you can just see from these graphs, um, roughly under 6% of growth gave you 1.6% um, uh, GDP per capita growth. By this last period, close to 8 only gives you 1.9%. So in fact, exports are translating into less growth than they have in, in the past. And part of this is a problem that African countries are facing as late bloomers. You know, coming into exports or increasing exports in a world where you already have the Chinas, the Indias, the Brazils, countries with A, large populations, which means that they occupy more rungs on the technological ladder than has 
uh, happened in the past. So in the, in the past, if you thought of countries, like if you think of Japan's experience, Japan and East Asia, Japan was kind of the lead, what has often been seen as the lead tiger or the lead geese in the East Asian story. It started one form of production, and as it graduated out of that form of production, other East Asian countries moved into that, um, into that, uh, onto that rung of, of, of production. If you think of a country like China, a country like China at one time was both doing aeronautical and pharmaceutical right at the top of the scale production, and at the same time having its experts visit Kenya to figure out how it could use floriculture, which Kenya was a leader in, to get its poorest areas, um, you know, to give production opportunities for its poorest areas. Okay. India, as a, at the same time as it's progressing on the industrial front, now India is not as rich as China, but still, as it's progressing on the industrial front, at the same time had experts visiting Kenya to see how they could translate tea production from simply large plantation to small holder. Right? So you have these large countries which are straddling the ladder rather than simply moving up um, the ladder, which has complicated things. How does uh, the globalization and inequality affect this change um, going forward? One, we have the story of a rising African middle class. Um, where is that story coming from? How does it relate to this? One, globalization has meant that the African rising middle class today is demanding wages that are equivalent to what Western professionals are also paid, right? When I was growing up, being an accountant or a lawyer in, in Kenya or in East Africa, at least if you were a local, not the expatriates, but a local meant that you were paid relatively, you were paid high compared to compatriots, but low on the international scale. Today, that's no longer the story. Lawyers and accountants are making much closer to international comparisons, partially because of globalization, partially because they can, they can to a certain extent, enter an international job market, okay? So that has meant that there has been some movement in terms of the incomes. If, if, if total income is not rising at fa as fast, then it means that some of that income, more of that income is going towards compensating them. The other part is an old story which we stopped talking about in development studies, is what was called the demonstration effect. Right? The demonstration effect was the idea that initially poor countries, as they changed, um, had just the goods which were produced in their own goods for consumption. Okay? Later producers or later developers actually see the consumption of their counterparts in rich countries, right? So if you're a high-income person in Kenya, you see the high-income person in England driving the Bentley or the Jaguar, right? And so rather than just agreeing to drive a car because that's what's available, you now want to import the Bentley or the Jaguar. Right? And now this has spread with globalization because it's come down to the level of food and the supermarket. Right? So we're getting this very perverse thing where we are getting French, British, and other American supermarkets now coming into Africa and selling the same goods that they sell in their own countries. Right? And pushing out African goods and foods. Okay? Um, and at the same time, you've had during this period with the opening up of markets, the deindustrialization as the more advanced competitors came in who had lower costs. I'm going to skip, because of time, the, the list of things on local inequality, because I'll, I'll come back to some of it in, 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 this, in the discussion. 
So at the end of this period, we can think of African economies which are characterized by high inequality, high unemployment and underemployment, a significantly poor infrastructure because after the 1970s, there was little investment until recently. Weak states, and when I say weak states, I don't mean that they're not necessarily repressive. I just mean they're weak in actual policy formulation and policy implementation. The African state doesn't actually reach the village, to so to say, as much as we think it does. Okay? Um, there's a neoliberal global environment, and these competitors on all steps of the technological ladder, and of course the world crisis around the environment. So then, so the agrarian questions and the questions of change I think that we need to consider, or the principles that we need to think about if we're to have growth, is that we need growth with some level of equity, um, and particularly horizontal equity. Um, and the reason why it's important to have horizontal equity is that one of the things we have to think about is that Equity or inequality is correlated with distrust, okay? So we have empirical measures which show that where countries or where groups are unequal, then the degree of trust is much lower, okay? The process of development is often a process of picking winners and losers, okay? And if you're going to have a state that is going to be forced to pick winners and losers, it becomes much more difficult for such a state to do that in a context of distrust, right? Because if I'm the state and I have to pick a winner or a loser, each one of you is going to distrust why I'm picking a particular group or a particular firm as the winner. Whereas in a more equal state, in a more equal space, where you all think you have equal opportunities, you might be more trusting to give me the opportunity to pick the winner, right? knowing that the outcome, the broader outcome will be better for all. We have to have more labor intensive growth, which is a challenge in a world where, you know, 60 years ago, I could, we could tell people, okay, we need to build a road, and we're literally going to build it by hand, right? Now, if you tell people we're going to build a road by hand, they think you're taking them backwards. But what it does mean is that you import the bulldozer, right, which is driven by one person and does the job that maybe a hundred people did before, right? So there is, there is a cost, there is a cost to this. We have to ensure, and we have to ensure environmental sustainability. What are some of the policies I think can, can, can work within this? One, land is still a crucial issue. And in many countries, we have to think about the question of land redistribution. I know people get all tied up in knots um, when land distribution is spoken about. But in fact, one, one of the reasons a place like South Korea, and to a certain extent even China, although not as much as, as, as South Korea, um, and a better example is, is, is Finland, why these countries have remained relatively equal was because the most important asset, land, was redistributed just before the growth space. So in fact, if you redistribute wealth broadly just before the growth phase, then you have a chance that most people can equally participate in that growth phase. Right? In the African context, what we have going on is that Growth is accessible just to a small group of people, right? So even when countries show 6%, 7% rate of growth, you still have increasing poverty, okay? Because growth is ac accessible to just a small group of people. The other reason to have land redistribution is because of the structures of these economies, land has been used both as a speculative device, so where people buy and sell land, which is not productive, they're just simply buying and selling land. You guys know about rotating credits and saving um, organizations in, in many African countries. 
in now a number of places, um, and Kenya particularly, some of these have now just focused on buying and selling land. It's where people put money together. You know, every month they put money together. Sometimes it goes to one person. Sometimes they invest it. And now there's some which just every few months go out, buy a piece of land in the hope that the land value will go up. They'll subdivide it and make money. Even without direct land redistribution, I think there's a fairly easy mechanism for land redistribution, which is uh, taxation of land, which in many African countries, believe it or not, does not exist. In many African countries, land is not taxed, or where it's taxed, it's often only urban land, where there are rates for urban land. And what this means is that you can hold land, you can hold huge sections of land at no cost. If land had some taxation, even if you wanted to hold huge sections of land, you would at least have to make it somewhat productive to maybe pay some of the taxes, which means either you directly contribute to agriculture or you contribute to employment or you give up the land and somebody else uses it and you put your money somewhere else. Okay? Now, part of doing this will require us to also improve kind of the financial instruments so that people who are speculating in land can take that money and invest it in other productive activity. So one of the things you're going to see going through this series of policy suggestions is that it's not only in the rural area that you need to make policy changes. You have to make them across, across the board. Um, the other part of this, and I won't go through all of it, but is creating small commercial farmers. A lot of discussion of African agriculture has often focused on kind of moving from small farms to large farms with the idea that large farms are industrial. And there's an issue here. One, I think there's a misconception about returns to scale and how you think about returns to scale. Returns to scale is the idea that as things get larger, it gets cheaper to do things, right? Now, if you think of the entire value chain rather than simply just the agricultural, the farming part, right? You can take advantage of returns to scale at different parts of the value chain, okay? And then that changes how you think about this. So, you know, often the example I use is people will say, but small farms produce very little. But, you know, if any of you have an eighth of an acre in Burgundy and you want to give it up, I'm willing to take it, okay? And the point is an eighth of an acre in Burgundy right, producing wine has very high income compared to an eighth of an acre producing something else somewhere else, okay? So the, the question is how you think, it's not just the smallness of the land, it's what you do with the land, okay? Um, recently there was an article, I can't remember in which English paper, but um, about one of your coffee shops or restaurants was bringing in Yemeni coffee and Yemeni coffee, which now gets sold at something like $50 for 12 ounces, okay? Um, because they've found some small village that still produces it in an ancient way, you know, blah, blah, blah story, okay? I have a lot of Ethiopian villages like that for you, <laughs> okay? So again, it's, 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 it, there's a story here about what the commodity is and how it's sold and where you get the returns to scale, okay? Now, what, what, so taking cooperatives seriously, I think, is important. And I'll just say in, in the question and answers, you could ask me about this. You know, there's a model where Kenya moved from being a relatively low producer of tea to one of the two largest black exporters of black tea and which was done through a cooperative, a large national cooperative. And we can talk about that. Now, the challenges are, one, via the structural adjustment period, the neoliberal period, there has a perception of cooperatives as being inefficient and bad has been produced, such that when I interviewed the managing director of this cooperative, um, I asked him, so you guys are a cooperative? And he said, no, we're a private company. And I said, no, I understand that you govern yourself 
after the, under the Private Companies Act, but you're a cooperative. He said, no, no, we're not. We're a private company. I said, okay, so can I buy shares? He says, do you grow any tea? <laughs> so so they only, their owners are only tea farmers, but they want to see themselves as a cooperative, but they're actually, I mean as a private company, but they're actually organized as a cooperative. Um, I am not all gaga about technology, but there are places where technology has worked. And there are ways to harness technology um, in a way that can improve farmers, can do what a lot of old style cooperatives did. And let me just mention this SNS system in, 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 in Rwanda. Um, the important part of this is to understand that technology does not work in a vacuum and the, the success of this technology has been around the fact that actually the government, the Rwandese government, has actually created a backbone in which it has given everybody an individual ID and it has given that e individual ID is connected to the land registry, which makes giving credit, information on farming, on, on climatic conditions, etc., very efficient. Okay. Again, I won't go through all this because um, of lack of time, but we can come back to this. Then we need to think of how to create rural employment while ensuring sustainability. Um, rural environmental conservation is an important part of this, which can be labor intensive, so reforestation, etc. cetera. Um, rural infrastructure is another important part of this. African rural areas still have a dearth of roads and a dearth of um, water availability and production, particularly for irrigation. In most African countries, apart from countries like Egypt, less than 5% of farming is irrigated. Lastly, rural homes are still often constructed very much in what, with, with, with much less um, long, long standing materials. And so I think a process of rural home upgrading a com will lead to a combination of improvement in skills and can also be the basis of kind of rural manufacturing. So if you look at most industrialized countries, construction is an important part and often a lead indicator of growth, okay? And so bringing that to the rural area um, can be an important part of growth. Um, let me make the point that although I talk about rural policies, the, the question of transition is one that occurs not just in the rural area, but one that must be connected to more general policy. Okay, so rural policy cannot be talked about separate from issues of regional integration and trade. Okay, so I think there are opportunities here. Malawi sometimes runs a maize surplus when people in Kenya don't have maize, but then the maize we get ends up coming from the US, which makes no sense, right? But it's a question of rural integration. Oh, well, sometimes it can be worse. It can be maize in Western Kenya, and there's no maize in Northern Kenya, but the maize that gets to Northern Kenya, it comes from outside the country. So um, we need to expand the financial system as I noted earlier when I talked about um, land reform, you know, the general improvement in skills, development and training, and expanding basic consumer and agro input manufacturing alongside the cooperatives um, that we've, we've, we've talked, um, that I have talked uh, about. Now, it's, it's, it's nice and easy to give you this list of policies, long list, which I haven't fully explained, and, and feel free to ask me about them. Um, but then the question is, who does this? Okay. Now, you know, in our lazy moments, or when we're working as consultants for governments, then, you know, you, you write this list of policies and you send them to the government. 
Um, but you're talking about a set of governments which, A, don't necessarily have the capacity or the belief in these kinds of uh, policies. Tandika Mkandawira, who I would argue is Africa's leading political economist, often says the, the neoliberal consensus died in Washington, but is still very much alive in Africa, right? The people in charge in Africa were all trained under the neoliberal consensus, okay? The training that's going on in Africa continues along those same lines, okay? So you do have um, the, this problem of the lack, in many instances, of a developmental state. So what do you do in the absence of a developmental state? The movers of much of the world are social movements, right? And I would argue that it's, it's incumbent upon those of us who think this way of thinking of progressive movements which are not only political, but also are the basis of material transformation. Okay? So while you're doing your one's political work, you can think of cooperatives which are farmer-owned, worker-owned farms that process or transport or service these rural goods that are being produced. Community-owned firms that build or maintain the public infrastructure that is going to be needed for this kind of transition. So it's not simply enough to think about what the policies are. We also have to think about how we do them and who is going to do them for this to take place. And with that, I will end and thank you very much. Over to you, Alfredo. Um, thanks very much. This is not working, is it? It is. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much, Mangi. This is a fantastic uh, presentation. It's very, very much, everything that you've said is very, very much in the SOAS tradition. Uh, and these are lines of work that absolutely belong uh, here. Um, there are traditional uh, debates within this institution about uh, agriculture, the role of agriculture in development, the relationships between uh, the agrarian economy and manufacturing uh, growth, the uh, size productivity debate, uh, which uh, you mentioned, uh, and particularly in the case of Africa, the um, influence and scope for structural uh, transformation. All this is very much uh, at home here. Also the point of view that you took, a macro point of view, a class point of view, um, and theoretically informed as opposed to what you see very commonly in this kind of discussions of uh, this very descriptive um, uh, telling stories uh, kind of uh, approach that, again, th that would not belong uh, in SOAS uh, very uh, easily. Uh, what you presented, as, as far as I can see, is a story of uh, dependence, a story of external dependence and attempts to overcome uh, dependence, attempts to overcome structural economic uh, dependence and attempts to overcome uh, political and ideological and policy-making dependence uh, as well. Uh, it is a story of disinclination uh, to, of African elites uh, in general to understand those relationships of uh, external dependence uh, and pursue uh, in a determined, organized, purposeful uh, way uh, the uh, capacity, the internalization of capacity to uh, drive their own uh, economic growth and, and to drive their own processes of uh, social and economic uh, transformation. So this, this inclination uh, could be seen perhaps, and maybe this is my first question to you, could be, this be seen as a political constraint to growth? So in addition to the traditional constraints to growth, balance of payments, fiscal constraint, uh, labor constraint, etc., is there a political constraint to growth and what form uh, does it take? Is it absolutely entirely conjunctural to each uh, particular circumstance? Um, then you also, I think, advance on those traditional uh, debates because uh, you bring together those debates about agrarian change, the political economy of agrarian change, together with the heterodox literature on industrial policy and then apply that to uh, Africa. Uh, you have the uh, traditional debates about economic independence and transitions to socialism that don't apply uh, anymore. You have an updated debate 
uh, about manufacturing growth, the scope for manufacturing development in sub-Saharan Africa, touching on something that I think you uh, mentioned uh, but, and then moved on to something else, but I'm particularly curious about uh, premature deindustrialization in Africa. What is happening uh, around uh, sub-Saharan Africa in particular? Having said this, very briefly, and to complete uh, a couple of additional questions. So how do you see your own work in relation to those agrarian debates of the 1970s and 80s and those currency, current policy uh, debates on the political economy of Africa uh, as well? And then a much bigger, broader question, I suppose, perhaps impossible to answer, but let's try. Uh, what are the limitations to successful developmental states in sub-Saharan Africa. Why is it that success has been so, uh, so limited? Uh, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Great. Well, why don't you um, take a few minutes to reply, and then we can open it out to questions from the floor. Okay. Thanks so much, um, Alfredo. Uh, so I'll try to be quick so that we, we leave sufficient time. Um, is there a political constraint to growth? I, I completely agree. I, I completely agree with that um, premise. And, and what I would say is that one of the things that might help us, um, or one of the things, that, one of the ways I think about it is a political constraint to growth due to inequality, right? The inequality is not something that appears sui generis. It's something that's created, and there are people who are benefiting from an economy that produces this inequality, okay? So if you change the structure of that inequality, so one of the problems of inequality and why we need to focus on inequality, one of the problems of it is that it generates a group that's benefiting, and that group will block changes that would change the distribution of income. Now, um, that means you have a problem, but there are different ways to proceed. One is, of course, having an open discussion about inequality. Um, you know, people sometimes think talking is a waste of time, but changing minds does matter, right? I mean, we are now in a world where people have started to recognize um, across the world that inequality is a problem, okay? In the 1970s, I lived in a Kenya in which the president and the state did not want people talking about inequality, okay? There was a conscious attempt not to do it. In Kenya, post-independence, there was an attempt to redistribute some of the land. It wasn't very successful, but there was uh, an attempt to redistribute some of the land, okay? And so you, and we had a large farm survey and a small farm survey. And you saw the large farm survey, and in the early 1960s, you see the number of large farms dropping. Then by 67, 68, they start rising again. As there is now a reconsolidation of large farms under now African landholders. By 72, the series itself just disappears. Okay, it starts rising and then it's no longer published, right? So it was to that extent that, you know, there was an attempt to stop this discussion of inequality. So both, you know, actually thinking of ways in which we can um, reduce inequality, uh, that's important. Talking about it, I think, is important because you hope even those people who want to save capitalism have to think about this if they are, you know, even if it's at, the, if it's at, at, at um, that level. And then thirdly, it's always easier if there is some growth, okay? So if we're having growth, then it's easier to redistribute at the margins. I'm not saying that's the only thing you're going to do, but it's always easier to redistribute at the margins than redistributing what people themselves have. And there's still a lot of low-lying fruit, I think, in African countries where if growth could be expanded or more consistent, then redistributing at the margins could have some impact. 
So short of a revolution, that's, that, that's, that, that, that's what I would point to. Um, yes, uh, in fact, this work connects to other work on industrialization, and I don't see the agrarian transition as separate from the question of industrialization and industrial policy. And one of the interesting things, as you pointed out, is that Africa went through a premature industrialization, but it was a very much policy-driven uh, deindustrialization, right? What you had was all the support that infant industries get in the early phase were taken out under the idea that African countries had failed in kind of the import substituted industrialization. Okay? Now, one of the stories that is not told often is that even in the East Asian case, we kind of start from export led growth, but in all those cases, without an exception, there was a phase of industrial. Um, import substituted industrialization. And what's key about these cases is those governments realized when they had to move from import substituted industrialization to export led growth. Not that import substituted industrialization was a failure, but in fact, it was what was often used to build the capital, which then went into export, um, uh, export, -led, um, export led growth. So there's a premature industrialization in the African context, which is due to kind of which is due directly to structural adjustment. Another note of point here is that ISI never failed in Africa. And here's my basic argument for why ISI never failed or did not fail in Africa. If you look at the period that ISI had in Africa, it was an extremely short period. Most countries end up getting their independence after 66. Right? It's after 66 that you have more than 30 independent African countries. So let's even say we even take back and say around 64 or 62 when you have you know, 20, 30, 30 independent African countries. Let's say a country in 63 decides you know, it, it's just got an independence, it's going to do import substitute and industrialization. And let's say it's got its act completely together. Right? So it's an ideal country. So it's going to do import substitute and industrialization. Okay, first of all, it will take some time, a year maybe, to put together the plans for import substituting industrialization, okay? So that's one thing. It will take another couple of years to build the plants and the infrastructure. So we're already three years into this. We're about, you know, we're at 66, 67, okay? And then you start producing. You're going to, you're, there's a learning process. We are already at 1970, okay? And then shortly thereafter, you're hit by a worldwide crisis, right? So where these firms fail is due to the crisis and not due to a problem with import substituted industrialization in of itself, right? Because the ideal country did not even have sufficient time to really move beyond the infant industry phase. Okay, so I've given you an ideal country. Most of these countries, the industries were nowhere near full production by the time the crisis uh, hits. Um, uh, what are the limitations to successful development states? Um, the limitations to successful development states, I think, is that much of African politics has not been, uh, has not grown organically from the ground, is not a class-based politics. Um, and so the nature of the state itself is not representative of even a broader section of the elite, okay? So in the cases of successful developmental states, it's not that they've necessarily been democratic, but they have at least covered the majority of the elite. So the elites as a group agree that this is what we want to see and are willing to push it through. That has not been the case of much of African politics. The elites themselves are highly divided um, for various reasons, whether they are its relation to 
people who are in elite positions because of relations of external dependence, people who are in elite positions because they represent an old aristocracy, or people who are in elite positions because they in some sense represent a group in the country. So there's this, there are these various divisions that I think make it more difficult for even the elite, if you take it from that perspective, to, uh, to produce developmental states. Now, they, there are two places where there has been somewhat of an attempt, I think, of a successful attempt at developmental states. And both of these states, A, are smaller, and B, have different histories. Okay? So the most recent one, of course, is Rwanda. And this is coming out of a very traumatic experience. And out of that traumatic experience, being able to unify a large section of the elites to actually engage in this process of developing an, um, a developmental state. Right? Uh, a, a very clear understanding on the part of this elite that if you don't improve lives for Rwandans, we as an elite cannot keep the positions that we have, and we're going to keep coming back to, you know, essentially genocide that has occurred more than once in Rwanda and Burundi. So there's a very conscious attempt by that elite to substitute uh, improved material welfare for, for people giving up power. The other case is, is Botswana, and Botswana was not colonized in the sense that other countries were colonized. Remember, it was a labor reserve for South Africa, and it's actually Botswana aristocracy who come to Britain and say, hey, those South Africans, we're worried about them. Can we strike a deal? Right? So the process of colonialism does not mean a kicking out of the old aristocracy, but rather a management of the colonial economy by the old aristocracy who then continue to manage the economy post-independence. Okay? So Botswana is a very interesting case, which has remained, in fact, despite having multi-party elections, really a one-party state that works. Okay? Um, how do I see my work in relation to agrarian debates? I, I see my work very much as, um, and depending on where I present, very much in the tradition of, of, of the debates of, of, of the 70s and 80s, very much um, in the work of thinking about modes of production, thinking about articulation of different modes of production or different forms of, of production. So I see it very much in, in that spirit. I think um, where I dis, maybe disagree with a lot of people is around or a significant number of people in these debates about agrarian transformation is the issue around how agriculture changes, okay? And in particular, the idea that you go this transformation from kind of either smaller agriculture or feudal large agriculture to large capitalist agriculture, right? I think it's very particular. I think that I, I would argue that there may be different paths in the same sense that within those debates, there's kind of what's called the American road, which is kind of a more capitalist road, and the Junker road, which is kind of the old feudal farm becoming this agro-industrial complex. Um, you know, I, I would argue that maybe there is a third road or even a third and, and a fourth road. And what I would encourage us to explore in this sense is to look at agriculture not simply as farming, because agriculture is no longer simply farming. Agriculture is the production of agricultural crops all the way to the market. Okay? And if the African farmer controlled the coffee bean from their farm to the market, literally, to the retail market, literally their payment increases hundredfold, right? Each espresso you pay for, how much do you pay for an espresso in this country? One shot. Three pounds. Three, three pounds each. 
the farmer receives less than that for a pound of coffee. Right? The farmer receives less than three pounds for a pound of coffee. Each pound of coffee produces something like 120 cups of espresso. That's a gap. And, I, and the reason why I focus on coffee and not even something like tea is because you can take the raw coffee bean like Ethiopians do, and literally roast it in your backyard. I.e., what I'm pointing out is that it's not high technology here. That's not, you know, it's not a rocket science that makes this jump. It's packaging, processing, and a story. Right? And so those are things which I think African firms African cooperatives can start exploiting and moving into. Excellent. Well, let's open it up to the floor then. Hands up if you've got a question you'd like to ask. Patrick will give you the mics. Yeah, start with you. Yeah, thank Go you ahead. very much for your really interesting presentation. I'm Hannah. I'm studying about food security and rural development here at SOAS. Um, so you are talking about the expansion of global supermarket in Africa. So my questions are, I have two questions, and they are both regarding um, the expansion of the supermarket in Africa. So my first question <laughs> is that how do you think this um, expansion of global supermarket is affecting the food security in the community in Africa? And second, how this is affecting the local small farmers? Um, are they included or are they excluded? If they are included, how? And then if they're excluded, and then what is the structural change of rural um, community due to this change? Thanks. Okay, great. There's one next to uh, you there. Hey, thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. Um, I had a question about the What's new... What's your name? Oh, Clara. Um, I had a question about the new Silk Road um, and how the, you see that affecting growth. The new? The new Silk Road, China's okay. investment in transportation. Yeah. Because it seems like so much of agriculture is about mm -hmm. pricing due to infrastructure, and so much of infrastructure underlays these political and growth questions. So do you think that will change these growth patterns, and will it improve or not improve inequality and growth? Okay. There was a hand at the back. No? Okay, we'll go here at the front. Uh, you talked about coffee prices. Oh, Your sorry. name? Mohammed. Uh, oh. So you talked about coffee prices and how you know, farmers don't get paid their due. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a problem we've seen for quite a few decades now. And I think Ethiopia is one of the first countries to introduce commodity exchanges. Uh, yet, you know, 10, down, 10 years down the line, uh, it hasn't really helped much the farmers. And I think your solution was you know, a community-led, community uh, sort of cooperative that is community-led. Mm -hmm. But given that you know, colonialism or you know, today is quite disrupted, community is quite disrupted, and that village community is not really as cohesive as it was in the past, how can communities come together to improve their, their prices? Okay. Do you can want I to answer those? those yeah. and then Let we'll me take those first. There'll be more chances. Okay. Uh, quickly, thanks for, uh, for your uh, questions. These, these are all great questions. Um, and I wish I had, I, I should do this lecture in a couple of lectures. Um, so Hannah on global supermarkets. You know, that, that some of what I missed out, first of all, is, you know, the saddest part of this is, first of all, the global supermarkets are never successful if they come in first. Okay? So, in fact, what you find in most African contexts is either mid-scale small retailers or, in some cases, fully blown local supermarkets, which actually create a home market, which change consumer demand and get people going to supermarkets, okay? Then after the customer has been produced, because customers, you know, forget what all these people around shock therapies say that you kind of just create markets and then it, everything happens. We have to be inculcated with going to buy goods, right? It, it's not something natural. We have to be inculcated with where to go and buy goods. Right? And so, you know, in some places people go to very different stores for all goods. In other places people do go to supermarkets. 
right? I grew up when people went to actual markets, right? Markets and small stores, right? So moving people to supermarkets was a job. There was, the, the, you needed to create that consumption culture or that kind of consumption culture. And that was done by African markets, African supermarkets. After the African supermarkets are successful and they have built up a scale that is large enough for the international supermarket, then the international supermarket can come in and be successful. Okay? And this is not just in supermarkets. Same thing happens with airline transportation. Okay? After the crisis of 1972, the world's airlines forgot about Africa. And I mean literally forgot about Africa. Okay? In the late 1970s, Nairobi had maybe nine, ten international companies, national airlines, you know, British overseas, etc., so on and so forth, flying into Nairobi. By 19, late 1980s, most of them had stopped coming. Okay? This space was then taken up by African airlines, specifically the Kenyan National Airlines, Ethiopian Airlines, right, and a little bit South African Airlines, okay, and which held this market, continued developing it, such that in 2006, Kenya Airways was amongst the most profitable airlines in the world. In 2006, Kenya Airways flying 36 planes made $60 million, okay, Southwest, which was the largest, flew 400 planes and made about $300 million. Per passenger, Southwest made $7 per passenger. Kenya Airways made $37 per passenger. Okay? What was that a signal for? That was a signal for other airlines to say, oh, wait a minute. There's some action here. Okay? Ethiopia has also been successful throughout this period. Now, Ethiopia has a, long, a much longer period. Ethiopian Airlines has a much longer period of success and therefore has built a much larger unit. But part of what we've seen now is all these airlines are back, right, and in large number. And they're only back because there were airlines which during this kind of protected period where they ignored Africa, right, there were airlines that actually built these, these, these networks. So it's no longer a question of Qatar Airways or British Airways actually trying to work out how many passengers will it fly from Nairobi to London. It is actually, it can see Kenya Airways, Ethiopian Airways, etc., flying thousands of passengers to, uh, to London and say there is a market here that we can take advantage of. So, the, so there's this first part of where essentially the Africans do the work and somebody else comes and gains later, right? Given this, this kind of history. And here the failure I think is a lot. The state and the state's ability to support local production and to protect for a while um, local production. How does it affect food security? I think the global supermarkets have, have meant more access for middle class and higher income people in terms of, of what's available. I come from a little village. Well, my mother lives in a little village outside Nairobi now. Um, this is where she retired. Are there any Kenyans in the room? OK, people know a place called Kitengela which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a small village. Um, we now have a supermarket that looks like any market in, you know, central London or New York with, you know, the whole grain section. And, um, in fact, I should have uh, 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 put a picture up. So you get, you get this, and it does mean those people with higher incomes benefit. The flip side of this is that there are some of these things which are not processed locally. So I'll give you a slightly different story 
that I think may help, is easier to understand and something which you know, young people relate better to, the manufacturing of beer. So if you look at beer, for example, the largest company is South African breweries, uh, one of the largest companies in the world. And South African breweries has often been in the region in competition with Kenya breweries, okay, which is a large concern. And in fact, across the continent, Kenya breweries was, is the only breweries which didn't get sucked up by South African breweries. So one of the other parts of the story is the move of capital, particularly up from South Africa and also from other African countries to African countries, which is new. Now, what's the difference between South African breweries and Kenyan breweries? One of it, one of, part of it is scale. And this part of scale comes back to this story of global supermarkets. When South African breweries, for example, took over brewery, uh, took over one of the breweries in Tanzania, okay, the national brewery, Kenya breweries under its parent group, East African breweries, bought a smaller brewery in Tanzania. Now, what was the difference? Within five years, the people who used to produce for the national breweries, the farmers who used to produce for them, were no longer having their crops, their barley or hops purchased by uh, South African breweries because it's got a global value chain where it can source these crops the cheapest elsewhere. So literally, it comes to your country and just adds water. All right? It's like Coca-Cola. <laughs> Kenya breweries, on the other hand, doesn't have that capacity. Or any smaller concern doesn't have that capacity. So when Kenya breweries moves to Tanzania, it actually has to engage Tanzanian farmers. So in fact, whereas Kenya breweries expanded opportunities for farmers, South African breweries closed opportunities. And I think that's very similar to what's happening with the, with the global supermarket chains. Global supermarket chains come already with, you know, units that deliver. So there may be some foods which are particularly local, which it may source locally. But other foods which are international, like grain and wheat, which you can get on the international market, whereas the African supermarket may have bought that from local farmers and milled it in Kenya, it can just import this. So I think at some level it decreases opportunities for farmers and, and by decreasing the incentives for local farming, decreases food security. Then Clara asked about the new Silk Road and infrastructure and will it change growth? I'm not sure it, it will structurally change growth. I think there are two parts to this. One, given the kind of inequality that exists, we found that trade and growth um, gets distributed very badly. So if you have growth now, there are elites who can take advantage because they've got the wither all, right? You know, if you have a flight that opens up a new destination and that opens up potential of trade, who's got, who has the ability to engage in that? So there's one way which just the simple opening up doesn't necessarily change things structurally. So so that's one issue. So unless there's a conscious effort to think about how do, does this new infrastructure of connection, um, how do we take advantage of it? Unless there's a conscious connection on the African side to think about it, I don't think it will necessarily change growth. It might increase the amount of growth, um, which the connection to China has done, right? So it might increase the amount of growth, but it may not increase the distribution of growth. And I don't think, for African countries, it's not sufficient to just increase growth. Okay, so I did an exercise. So um, remember I talked about the growth elasticity of, uh, the, of employment. Um, I did an exercise which looked at Kenya's plan, uh, what was called Kenya's 2030 plan, Vision 2030, which was the idea of how do we transform this country into a middle income country. And the idea was, okay, one, the main thing was 10% growth. Okay, so the idea was, if Kenya has 10% growth, and then, you know, there's a lot of writing, a lot of nice stuff, more technology, more of this, but when you read the, through the plan carefully, there was no real structural change, right, in terms of, there, there, there weren't 
advocating policy that had structural change. So I did a simple exercise. I said, okay, since there's nothing in here that says to me there, is, there are ways in which the structures of production are going to change, let me just take 10% growth, right, and see how much employment it generates, okay? And your, your reserved labor hardly decreases. You know, over 20 years, you know, you go from something like 80% rural to 70% rural in terms based on their employment. Okay, now people might move out just because they've moved into the urban sector. But th they'll still be, then they'll just be in the informal sector, right? So there has to be a conscious attempt to think about how do these connections actually uh, fit into the growth plan of a country. Then Mohammed, you had this question about coffee prices and commodity exchanges and uh, um, communities being very fragile and how, and, and how do we do this? Um, okay, so again, <coughs> yeah, the commodity exchanges, it, it's, it's interesting, the person who started the commodity exchanges in, in, um, in Ethiopia uh, got her PhD roughly the same time as me, also out of the UC system, and we met a lot. And um, she's a very genuine person and was looking at ways to actually improve the life of farmers. Um, but the idea was partially this idea that government always takes away from farmers and if you can sell, you can get higher prices at auction. Now the truth is this thing is not new, right? So Kenya has always auctioned its coffee and tea. This is something that's not talked about. It was through a government bo body but whereas everybody else went to New York, Kenya had a Mombasa auction that did the coffee and tea. And while the prices were slightly higher, they didn't necessarily come down to the farmer. So we already know that this, this is not, you know, if we, if, if we go beyond kind of our blackboard economics and read a little bit of history, we'll find that it's not always the case. You know, markets don't work in the way they work on the blackboard. So, that's one thing. The fact that, yes, communities have, um, have become fragile um, is both a negative and a positive in, in this sense. And this is thinking of this dialectically. One of the things that I found very interesting is in many ways, in some parts of the country, the collapse or partial collapse of some of these bodies that trade coffee and tea particularly, has opened up a space for actual local firms to come back in and take advantage of this, offering local farmers much more. Because if the farmer kept their coffee and tea and is just kind of planting around it, which has happened in many cases, right? Um, then if somebody comes in and says, look, I could get something for you out of basically not much because you've already established your coffee and tea. And the way to organize it is this way as a community, then people go for it. Um, so I think there is space. Crisis are opportunities as well. And so I think there is space. I don't think it's going to be easy. You're absolutely correct. And it's going to take sustained work. It's going to take, one of the things I missed talking about, it's going to take sustained convincing the youth that farming is actually a very progressive activity. Rather, the youth see farming as something that's done only by poor people. Okay, so you also, there's an ideological mindset that has to be changed. Um, I, I don't know if some of you know, there's a Kenyan known as Calestus Juma who died, who was big on technology, etc. He was once invited to a Central American country, and I, I can't remember which, so I won't mention a name. Um, in case I have the wrong one. But the government invited him to start up an agriculture, a school of agriculture in an area where farming was the main way of producing. And they said, look, you have all these ideas about technology and, and agriculture. We are giving you land. And if you can get this community, we will provide money for agriculture. What agricultural school? So you're going to be made the chancellor and, and stuff. Like that. So he went there and the local population were like, no, we don't want to hear about this, we don't want, don't talk to us about agriculture. And he spent some time with them, 
And rather than talk about traditional agriculture, which is much of what they were, uh, he started talking about hydroponics. He started talking about greenhouses and other forms of, uh, other ways of producing. Okay? And then he just left it and went back. Six months later, the community called him and said, we have our own land where we want to develop a college of agriculture and we want you to help us. Right? So as the young people changed their mindset and moved away from kind of the whole and that back-breaking work of agriculture to somehow see it as being this modern entrepreneurial activity, their view on it changed. So part of the story is also changing the view and getting people to see that agriculture is a very much part of the modern world. After all, some of the largest countries, you know, Australia, for example, are still very dependent on agricultural production. They've not given up on agricultural production. Um, the U.S. has low levels of labor involved in agriculture, but agriculture is still a very big part of, of the economy. So it's moving people away from the mindset of agriculture being that subsistence agriculture where you're struggling to it being part of this kind of more modern economy. Okay, I mean, um, thank you very much for that. It sounds as if maybe uh, there are people wanting to get into the room after us. So whilst I did promise you the opportunity for more questions, what I will do instead is invite you to um, a drinks reception where we'll have some food and some drinks and we can continue the discussion upstairs in the senior common room. Um, but before heading up there, please would you um, like to thank, join me in thanking our speakers this evening. Um, this is the final seminar of the series, but do look out for them starting again in uh, October 2019. And yeah, it's been great to see you all here this evening. Um, thank you very much.